If you have your Bibles with you, if you would open to 1 Samuel chapter 25, and if you don't have your Bibles with you, there's some in the pew right in front of you, little black Bible, 1 Cha- Samuel chapter 25, and we're going to be reading this whole chapter, all 40-something verses of it, so, uh, so let's just read this together, starting in verse 1. Then Samuel died. And all Israel gathered together and mourned for him and buried him at his house in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. And the man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it came about while he was shearing the sheep in Carmel. Now the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealings. And he was a Calebite. <clears throat> that David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, visit Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say, Have a long life, peace be with you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we have not insulted them, nor have they missed anything all the days that they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes. For we have come on a festive day. Please give whatever you find at hand to your servants and to your son David." When David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in David's name. Then they waited. But Nabal answered David's servant and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men whose origin I do not know? So David's young men retracted their way and went back, and they came and told him according to all these words. David said to his men, Each of you, gird your sword. So each man girded on his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went up behind David, while 200 stayed with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we were not insulted, nor did we miss anything as long as we went about with them while we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by night and by day. All the time we were with them, tending the sheep. Now therefore, know and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against all his household. And he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. Then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves of bread and two jugs of wine and five sheep already prepared and five measures of roasted grain and a 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and loaded them on donkeys. She said to her young men, go on before me. Behold, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. It came about as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain that, behold, David and his men were coming down toward her. So she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain I have guarded all that this man has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. And he has returned me evil for good. May God do so to the enemies of David, and more also if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey and fell on her face before David and bowed before him on the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please do not let my word... Do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. 
Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. Now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord is fighting the battle of the Lord, and evil will not be found in all of your days. Should anyone rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord of your God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord does for my Lord according to all the good that has, been, has spoken concern and appoints you ruler over Israel, this will not cause grief or a troubled heart to my Lord. Both by having shed blood without cause or by my Lord having avenged himself, when the Lord deals well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been much left to Nabal until the morning light, as much as one male. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. Then Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he, had, he was very drunk. So she did not tell him anything at all until the morning light. But in the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, so that he became as a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleased the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord has also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own land. Then David sent a proposal to Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her, saying, David has sent us to you to take you as his wife. She arose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your maidservant is a maid to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Then Abigail quickly arose and rode on a donkey with her five maidens who attended her, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David had also taken a Hinoam of Jezreel, and they both became his wives. Now Saul had given Michal, his daughter David's wife, to Pauti, the son of Laish, who was from Galam. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your scripture, God. God, we thank you for the, uh, the obedient heart of Abigail, Father. And Father, that, that she... Um, she had the boldness to do what was right, God. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the message that is found through this scripture, Father. Lord, that we can um, check our hearts and see who our heart is most like, Father. And, Father, Lord, that we can have a, a heart like Abigail this morning, God. So, Father, we pray for Pastor Matt as he comes up, Lord, to, um, to preach your message, to preach your word. And, Father, Lord, just um, speak to us this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I got him to read so he could pronounce those big names for me. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. And Father, I just pray that uh, you would calm my spirit, Lord. God, that I would be controlled by you. That my words would be your words. Father, anything from me, I ask that it would just go on deaf ears. But anything from you, Lord, I pray that it doesn't come back void, but it will accomplish everything you so desire. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God's chosen people were in chaos. 
in verse 1 of chapter 25 in the book of 1 Samuel, we see Samuel, the prophet of God, has died. The person who was leading Israel at the time, King Saul, God had removed his spirit from Saul and actually allowed an evil spirit to come upon him. God's next king, David, the real king, was with 600 renegades in the wilderness of Paran. The wilderness of Paran is located on the southern portion of the promised land. David was fleeing for his life because he just heard that his spiritual mentor, Samuel, had just died. King Saul had tried to kill David several times already, and next chapter he will try again. David was being squeezed. And we find out in chapter 25 in the book of 1 Samuel that he is running out of supplies for him and his men. His stress level on a scale of 1 to 10 was 10. Even though God had anointed him the next king. Even though God considered David a man after his own heart. You see, this lets us know that sometimes bad things happen to good people. And I wonder about you today. How is your life going? Your marriage, your kids, your work, your finances, your schoolwork, your health, or better yet, your heart. How are you really doing? How is your stress level at this very moment in your life? On a scale of 1 to 10, write down on your outline right now, what is your stress level? You know, today we're going to talk about how do you respond when you are stressed or in a difficult situation. You know, when you are having a really bad day and your wife disrespects you. Or you're in a hurry and you need to get on the other side of the bayou. You only have five minutes to get there and you pull up to the bridge and the arm is going down. Are you having financial difficulties and your car breaks or your refrigerator breaks or your kid comes in and says they need such and such for school? How do you respond in those difficult situations? You know, in 1 Samuel that Jordy just read, we're going to look at three people. The first person, Nabal. Now, I might pronounce that a little bit different, but I went on the internet and I pressed in Nabal, how do you pronounce it? And it said Nabal, okay? Now, some people say Nabal, so I'll probably go back and forth. But the second person is David. And the third person is Abigail. And we will see how each person responded to a difficult situation in their life. And I thought that I would talk to each per, about each person from a different location on the stage. So this music stand here is going to represent Nabal. So we pick up the verse, beginning in verse 2. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel, now the man's name was Abigail. I'm sorry, the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his dealings. He was a Calebite. So we have a man, and his name is Nabal. Nabal, as an adjective in Hebrew, means fool. So from this story, we will learn that that name is very appropriate from him. But not only was Nabal a fool, but look at verse 3. It says that he was harsh and he was evil in his dealings. You see, there's a French word that some of you use for this type of man, but I can't tell you in church. However, I will use the technical term, and I don't even know if I should say this, but he was a real gluteus maximus, if you will. Now, a fool in the Bible is synonymous with are equal to someone who doesn't know God. You know, Nabal doesn't say one time, he doesn't talk about God one time in anything he says in chapter 25. God was not on Nabal's radar. And it reminds me of Psalm 53, verse 1. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. 
although Nabal is a fool, verse 2 tells us that he's also very rich. You see, from the outside looking in, it looked like Nabal had everything going for him. He had a beautiful and intelligent wife. He had all the money he would ever need. But inside, Nabal was a godless fool. His servant and his wife, later in chapter 25, is going to call him a worthless man. The two people in his life that are supposed to be the most loyal to him, the two people that are supposed to respect him the most, know him as a worthless man. Nevertheless, the text says in the end of verse 3 that he was a Calebite. His lineage, his lineage comes from Caleb. Remember, Caleb was one of the 12 spies who went to scout out the promised land. And remember, 10 of those spies came back, and they were scared to death. They were fearful. And they told their, the other Israelites, they're too big for us. They're too strong for us. We shall not go in the land. But Caleb, full of faith, told Israel that they should surely go and take the land that God had promised them. You see, Caleb was one of only two men in that first generation that were in the wilderness that was allowed to go from the wilderness to the promised land. You see, Nabal, he came from very good stock. But you see, this reminds us, it's not really about your mom's faith or your dad's faith or even your great-great-great-grandfather's faith. It's about your faith. You see, just because someone in your family is faithful doesn't mean that you can't be a fool. And I'll say it the other way also. Just because mom and dad are fools doesn't mean that you can't be faithful. Not only did Nabal come from good stock, but Caleb, Nabal's relative, was from the tribe of Judah. Remember, Judah was the tribe that the Messiah, that Jesus Christ, would come from one day. Do you remember what tribe David was from? He was also from Judah. So what does this mean? This means that Nabal and David, they were related. So what was Nabal doing? He was shearing his sheep. Now this only happened two times a year. And when it happened, it was a very festive occasion. And the shepherds would get paid when their sheep were being cheered. And the way that the shepherds would get paid was by the number of sheep that they brought back to the owner. Remember, David and his men, they protected those sheep. Now, the last thing that I want you to see in the first couple of verses is that they're in a city called Carmel. Now, if you remember earlier in 1 Samuel, it says that King Saul actually set up a statue of himself in Carmel. So we have a godless fool named Nabal in a city of Israel that actually allowed their king to set up a statue for himself. We have everything we need for a complete recipe of disaster. Now verses 4 to 9 tells us that David hears that Nabal is shearing his sheep. So he sends him 12 men to go and talk to Nabal. And this is basically what he says, or tells them to say, Hey, we protected your men and your sheep while they were grazing. And they didn't lose one sheep. So please give us whatever payment you think we deserve, whatever payment that you have on hand. And David tells the men to greet Nabal in his name. And we'll come back to that in a second. Look with me, beginning in verse 10. But Nabal answered David's servant and said, Who is David? And who is this son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered from my shears and give it to men whose origin I do not know? So things are going really good for Nabal at this point. It is a festive day. If they had cash registers back in those days, this is what Nabal would hear. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. When all of a sudden these ten surly men come and say, we are ready for our payment now. You see, Nabal finds himself 
in a difficult situation. He had no clue what was about to happen. And we can relate sometimes, can't we? Things are going really well in our lives when all of a sudden the hammer comes down. You receive that phone call. Someone disrespects you. How are you going to respond at that very moment? Well, how did Nabal respond? He scorned David's men. He was harsh and he was evil. Look what he says. Who is David? Now, did Nabal not know who David was? Remember, it said that David told his men to greet him. How? In David's name. So it sure sounds like David knew Nabal. Abigail, Nabal's wife, she knew who David was. So why didn't Nabal know who David was? And look at the next question. And who is the son of Jesse? David's servants didn't say anything about David's dad. So Nabal knew who David's dad was. He also knew that David was running from Saul. Look at the end of verse 10. There are many servants today who are each breaking away from their master. You see, Nabal knew exactly who David was. How could he not? David was the man who killed who? Goliath. He was the man in which the women of Israel would say, Saul has killed thousands, but David, he has killed what? Tens of thousands. He probably even knew that David was anointed the next king. Abigail, his wife, knew. But what does he do? It's all about Nabal. Look at verse 11. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men whose origin I do not know? Seven times in this one verse, Nabal speaks in the first person. You see, a true man of God knows that everything he has is a gift from above. Nabal is prideful. It is all about him. Well, David finds out from his men what he said, and David is ticked off, and he is ready to kill. But thankfully, Abigail comes into the story, and we'll talk about that in a moment. However, as Abigail talks to David, after Abigail talks to David, she goes home to tell Nabal. And we pick up the story in verse 36. Then Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like a feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So he did not tell him anything at all until the morning light. But it came about in the morning when all the wine had gone out of Nabal, that his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, so that he became as a stone. And about ten days later it happened, that the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. Not only was Nabal having a feast, but what kind of feast was he having? A feast of a king. Nabal had no idea David was coming. Dr. Constable, one of my seminary professors, said, instead of feasting, Nabal should have been fasting. But one of the reasons why Nabal could feast, one of the reasons why he could have such a party, it's because David had protected his sheep, and not one of them was lost. However, Nabal, the godless fool, he's not only drunk, but the text says he is very drunk. So when he finally sobers up the next morning, Abigail tells him the news, and Nabal has some type of stroke or something, and ten days later, he's dead. You see, Nabal was in a difficult situation. He needed wisdom. But because Nabal was a fool, he didn't know God, he didn't care about God, and he didn't pray to God. And what happened to him? He ended up dead. And you can't really expect much from a fool, can you? And you know, if you were sitting in here, not a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, the Old Testament, I'm sorry to say, would call you a fool. The New Testament would say you are in darkness. But Jesus would have me tell you today that he loves you, that he wants to have a relationship with you, that he died on the cross for you. So if you do not know God 
and you want to know him, I challenge you, after I finish speaking, there'll be some elders up front. Come and ask them how you can begin a relationship with God. Our second person who's in a somewhat of a difficult situation is David. So I'm going to move to this music stand over here for David. And I want to be a little bit closer to you, so I'm going to move it up. Now, remember, David was a man after God's own heart. Unlike Nabal, David knew who God was. In 1 Samuel 16, 13, it actually says that God's spirit was upon David mightily from that point forward. You see, David had a relationship with God. And notice chapter 25 is squeezed between chapters 24 and chapters 26. And in chapters 24 and also in chapters 26, King Saul is trying to kill David. And remember, last week, Pastor Bill talked about King Saul going into the cave to relieve himself. And while Saul was in the cave, David and his 600 men were in the same cave. And David had an opportunity for revenge. But David didn't take that opportunity because God had put Saul as king, and David knew he shouldn't kill him. And in chapter 26, again, Saul is trying to kill David. And Saul and his army are actually sleeping one night in a camp. And it says, David and one man, they crept through the camp. And they found Saul where he was laying. And right by Saul's head was his sword. So David picked up the sword. And he had his water jug, and he took his water jug. And they crept out of the camp. David could have cut off Saul's head with his own sword, but he didn't. Because he knew that is not what God wanted him to do. But in our passage this morning, David is in another difficult situation. Supplies are running out. His spiritual mentor Samuel had just died. He and his men had protected Nabal's men and their flock, and they got no payment in return. Can you relate with David sometimes? Everything in your life seems to be going wrong, all at the same time. I would imagine that David was probably on edge. And you know, when we are on edge, it is easy for us to fly off the handle. How did David respond to this situation? Well, the text teaches us that he didn't respond. He reacted. Beginning in verse 12, So David's young men retraced their way and went back. And they came and they told him according to all these words. And David said to his men, Each of you gird on his sword. So each man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the baggage. David basically tells his men, let's get ready for battle. Let's go. David was on a mission. Notice, did David pray about it? No. He had one objective, and that objective is found at the end of verse 34, which says, surely they would not have been left to Nabal until morning, light as one, much as one male. David had planned on killing all of Nabal's men. Now remember, the Old Testament law was basically what? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now although Nabal was very rude to David's men, he didn't deserve death. And his men didn't deserve death. You see, David was not controlled by the Spirit of the Lord that was inside him. He was controlled by his flesh. In chapters 24 and chapters 26, David was completely controlled by the Spirit. He could have killed Saul both times, but he didn't, because the Holy Spirit of God inside of David was controlling him. You see, this lets us know that our relationship with God is moment by moment. As believers in Jesus Christ, the same spirit that was in David 3,000 years ago is in you and me as believers. Wherever you go, the Holy Spirit goes. He can control you if you allow him. And when the spirit of God who is inside of you controls you, then people are going to see certain things. You know what they're going to see? They're going to see love. 
They're going to see joy. They're going to see peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If I called your wife last Tuesday, or your coworker last Wednesday, or your boss last Monday, or your friend last Friday, would they describe the fruits of the Spirit? Or would they use words like angry, stubborn, mean, disrespectful, unloving, or whatever? You see, we can be controlled by the Spirit of God at 8 o'clock in the morning, but by 8.30, we can be in the flesh. Our Christian life needs to be lived moment by moment. You know, in chapter 24, David could tell 600 rebel men, do not touch Saul. Because the Spirit of God inside of David David gave him boldness. But just a little bit later, chapter 25, he could tell the same men, put on your swords, let's go kill. You see, apart from the Spirit of God working in you and me, listen, we are capable of doing Anything. Anything. How many of you, as believers in Jesus Christ, have done something that you've regretted? Look around. Apart from the Spirit of God working in you and me, we are capable of doing anything. Thankfully for David, this is not the end of the story. Abigail, of course, comes and talks to David, and she brings him gifts. And we will look at that speech speech in just a minute. But after she talks, look how David responded in verse 32. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment. And blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely they would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light, as much as one male. So David received from, from hand what she had brought him, and he said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I've listened to you, and I granted your request. While Abigail was speaking, listen to this, while Abigail was speaking, the spirit of the living God inside of David convicted him. And he had a choice to make. He could either justify himself or he could repent. And David repented. He was a man after God's heart. Look how he starts. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. David finally took his eyes off of his circumstances and put them on the Lord. You know, I love the fact that the text says, as the Lord God of Israel, who has restrained me. You see, it was the spirit of the living God in David that restrained him, that controlled him. So this begs us to ask ourselves a question. Who is controlling you on a regular basis? You know, I use this illustration all the time, but it's so practical. Let's say that this pencil represents a problem in your life. And this hand represents Jesus Christ. You see, what we have a tendency to do as believers is to concentrate on our problems. And we concentrate on our problems, and we concentrate on our problems, and we concentrate on our problems. Till guess what? The problem is all we see. Now, is Jesus still there? Yes, but it's almost like we forgot that he is. And what the Bible teaches us is we need to concentrate on Jesus. Now, is the problem still there? Yes, but Jesus will give us the grace. Jesus will give us the mercy. Jesus will give us whatever we need to help us in our problem. David finally got his eyes off of the problem and back onto the Lord. And as soon as he did, he received a new perspective. He received God's perspective. You see, sometimes God is going to talk to you through somebody. And a real friend should be able to look you square in the eyes and tell you what you're doing is wrong. 
And instead of you being defensive or justifying yourself, if they are correct, you should thank God for them, just like David thanked God for Abigail. And you should repent. David is, again, controlled by the Spirit. And you know, that's the great thing about our relationship with God. It's almost, and I've taught this before, that we have a door on our heart, an invisible door in our heart. And when we are controlled by the Spirit, that door is wide open. And the Spirit of God is working in us and through us. But you see, when we are not controlled by the Spirit, when we are controlled by the flesh, guess what happens to that invisible door? It shuts. But the only thing that we have to do, the only thing that we have to do to get that door back open, is to go back to Jesus. You know, I don't know where you are right now, but I just want you to think about last week, the last seven days. Were you mostly controlled by the Spirit, or were you more uh, controlled by your flesh? You see, I would imagine in a crowd this size that a lot of us has been controlled by the flesh. But Jesus is just saying, approach me, confess, Repent. And when you do that, that door springs wide open again. So when you are in a difficult situation this week, and you blow it, and you finally realize that you blew it, just go to Jesus. You see, what Satan wants you to do, Satan wants you to go into your cave. Satan wants you to isolate yourself by yourself. Satan wants you to go back to your old coping mechanisms whether that is drugs or alcohol or sex or pornography. Satan wants you to become angry. Satan wants you to be depressed. Satan wants you depressed so much that you would actually take a gun, put it to your head, and pull the trigger. But you know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying just one thing. Jesus is saying, come. 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 And that is what God's grace is all about. No matter how bad we've messed up, Jesus is asking us, come. You see, David got his eyes off of himself and onto God. He repented. But you know what? We're not finished, unfortunately, with David in this chapter. In the last few verses, David actually goes and asks Abigail, to marry him. What? You know what the problem is? David already has a wife. Now, I used to be a math teacher, so this is a pretty tough math question, so y'all follow me here. One wife plus one wife equals two wives. But the last few verses also tells us that he married another wife. So one wife plus one wife plus one wife equals three wives. (laughs) Trouble, yes. Okay, so what happened to that door, that invisible door in David's heart? It closed again. So now we come to our last person, Abigail, who the text describes as beautiful and intelligent, just like my neighbor, Abigail (laughs) Buzigar. Abigail is the hero, if you will, of this passage. So let's move to the podium to talk about Abigail. One of Abigail's servants comes and tells her what her husband, Nabal, has done. You see, the servant knew he could go to Abigail. But the text actually tells us that he was scared to go to Nabal. You know why he was scared to go to Nabal? Because Nabal was a fool, and he was a worthless man. And he actually says he knew Nabal wouldn't listen to him. But you see, he knew he could go to Abigail. And I ask, why did he know that he could go to Abigail? And I think the answer is is he had been watching Abigail. He had been watching how she responded to difficult situations. And since Abigail was a woman of God, he knew if I went to Abigail, even though this is the toughest of situations, she would know what to do. You know, that made me think about us. You know, as believers in Jesus Christ, as members or attendees of Community Bible Church, guess what? There's a lot of eyes on us each and every day, right? So the question is, what are people seeing when they're watching you day after day after day? 
So David is coming with 400 men to kill every male in her household. How does Abigail respond to this difficult situation? We pick up in verse 18. Then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves of bread and two jugs of wine and five sheep already prepared and five measures of roasted grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, go on before, before me. Behold, I'm coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And it came about as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain that behold, David and his men were coming down toward her. So she met them. Notice, and I, I found this a little striking, that Abigail, it doesn't say that she prays at first. I was expecting that. She goes immediately into action. However, we learn from the passage from David that God is the one who sent her. Although the text doesn't mention Abigail praying, she was in a moment-by-moment -moment relationship with the Lord. In New Testament terms, we would say that she was controlled by the Spirit. She knew what God wanted her to do, and she did it, no matter the consequences. So she comes around the mountain, and David and 400 men with swords on their belt come around the other way. Try to envision that scene. What was Abigail thinking at that very moment? I would imagine that her heartbeat is beating a thousand times a minute. And after David makes a few remarks, in verse 23 we read, When Abigail saw David, she hurried, dismounted from her donkey, and fell on her face before David, and bowed herself to the ground, and she fell at his feet and said, Oh, and me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Now remember, David was already anointed as the next king of Israel. Notice the text says three times that Abigail went to the ground. She fell on her face before David. She bowed herself to the ground. She fell at his feet. Nabal had scorned David's men. But Abigail gave the honor and the respect David deserved as the king of Israel. Also in this passage, Abigail is going to call David my Lord, meaning master, 13 times in this passage. But look what else she does. On me alone, my Lord, be the blame. In verse 28, she says, Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant. She put the entire blame of the incident on herself. Why would Abigail do that? Because she wanted to save her household. If David would have, if David would have killed her, Abigail would have thought it was worth it because she was trying to save her household. She was completely controlled by the Spirit. And you know, this makes me think of another man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, who also rode on a donkey on Palm Sunday. Jesus knew the fate that would happen to him. And though he had no sin, he would become the sin of the world. And Jesus didn't face a mere 401 men with swords on a hill. But Jesus faced the complete righteous wrath of God the Father on Calvary's hill. Why would Jesus do that? Because he wanted to save you and he wanted to save me. He was as innocent as innocent could be. But Jesus still went to Jerusalem. Greater love has no more than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. This is what Jesus did, and this is what Abigail would have done. A few minutes left, verse 25, beginning. Please do not let my word, Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent, now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be his Nabal. And now let this gift, which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord is fighting against the battles of the Lord. 
and evil shall not be found in all your days. And should anyone rise up to pursue you and seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lies of your enemies he will sling out as for the hollow of a sling. And it shall come about when the Lord shall do for my Lord according to all the good he has spoken concerning you, and shall appoint you ruler over Israel, that this will not cause grief or a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged himself. When the Lord shall deal with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Well, ladies, I got some good advice for you. I wouldn't advise you to call your husband a worthless man. Okay? But under the circumstances, I believe that Abigail was controlled by the Spirit. Abigail tells David that she didn't know that he had sent ten men. You see, Abigail's life was in danger, but the Spirit of God gave her boldness. Abigail had peace, she had self-control, she had kindness, and she had faithfulness. In her toughest moment, Abigail shined brightly. And you know, I look around this room right now, And I know of some of you that have gone through some difficult situations in the last year or two. And you know what? God has shined brightly through you. Next, Abigail prophesies and basically says that the Lord has restrained David from shedding blood and avenging himself. Notice this hasn't happened yet. Abigail had faith that God had gone before her and that he would answer her request. She was standing firm on her faith in God. So when you pray, when you are in a difficult situation, are you praying in faith that God is going to answer your question? Abigail tells David, May the Lord make an enduring house for David, because David is fighting for the Lord's battle, and evil will not be found in all your days. You know, I think Abigail is using a little reverse psychology here. You see, Abigail was basically telling David, what you're doing right now, it's wrong. This is evil. This is not the Lord's battle. And the reason that I can say that with such confidence is because how David responded. He knew what he was doing was wrong. And then she prays for David. And listen to this prayer of protection. That if anyone attacks him, that David would be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God, and that his enemies would be destroyed. You see, Scripture tells us that vengeance is not our own. That vengeance is the Lord's. And David will learn this through Abigail today. And finally, she recalls God's word that one day David would be ruler over Israel. She tells David, don't let what you're thinking about doing put a blemish on your record. If you do this, she basically tells David, your heart will be troubled. And David responds with this speech in repentance. You see, Abigail was in a difficult situation, but she trusted the Lord, she was obedient to the Lord, and she hung on to the words of the Lord. And God blessed her. Abigail was completely controlled by the Spirit. Even when she left David to go home, she didn't talk to her husband while he was drunk. She waited until the next day to talk to him. God had given Abigail much wisdom. She was controlled by the Spirit. So what about you this week? I am sure that there will be a difficult situation that you come across. How will you respond? If you are not a believer this morning, you know how you probably will respond? Like Nabal. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have one or two ways that you can respond. You could be like David. Or you can be like Abigail. You can be controlled by the Spirit of God. Or you can be controlled by your flesh. You can concentrate on your circumstances and on yourself. Or you can concentrate on Jesus. The door of your heart can be wide open. Or the door of your heart could be slammed shut. How will you respond this week? Your Christian life needs to be lived moment by moment. I will end with my favorite four verses in the entire Bible. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. If then 
you have been raised up with Christ. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. And Father, we would confess that there are times in our lives, Lord, even though we have your spirit inside of us as believers, that we would choose our flesh rather than allowing your spirit to control us. So Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ this week, Lord, and for myself, that in those moments of distress, Lord, when we receive that phone call or someone is disrespectful to us or someone pulls out in front of us in a car, whatever the situation is, Lord, that we would be like Abigail, that we would trust in you, that we'd have faith in you, that we would hang on to every one of your words. And Father, if there's a time this week where we blow it, and we come to that point where we realize that we blew it, Father, I just pray that we would come to you, that we would approach your throne room of grace with confidence. And as your word tells us, we will receive the grace and mercy we need in our time of need. So Lord, I ask for a blessing on my brothers and sisters in Christ today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.